Okay, everybody, welcome. Um, my name is Amelia Curtis, and I'm the Education Manager at San Diego Humane Society. And I want to welcome you all to our Pet Talk Sit, Stay, Heal, the Unique Benefits of Animal Therapy. Um, and we have a great panel this evening that's going to um, talk about some very cool and interesting things. Um, we have Melissa Sargent joining us from Hearts and Hooves, which is a um, animal therapy organization here in San Diego. And um, I think you'll find the animals she uses for therapy are not what you may always think of for a therapy animal. So she's gonna walk us through what she does. And then we're going to hear from um, Soul Paws. We have two speakers, uh, Shannon Kopp, who's gonna talk about her um, personal experience and founding her organization. Um, and then um, we have Patricia Flaherty Fishett, who's going to talk about the um, more of the research based side of um, how animals can um, benefit through therapy. So um, before we get started, I'll just go over some housekeeping. Um, we are recording this evening, so I will send out the recording to everyone in case you miss any component of the of the pet talk. Um, if you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat and I can um, ask them to the speaker for you or you can unmute and ask. Um, we will give a break after each person speaking so that you can um, ask your questions to that person specifically at that time. Um, and then um, I will send out any information um, that you see tonight um, in a follow-up email as well. So uh, you will get all the information um, following the, the lecture this evening. Um, I always like to also kick off the presentation by sharing a little bit about San Diego Humane Society. Um, so I am going to share my screen. And um, is everybody able to see um, this dog, Cora? Yes, okay. Um, so I always like to share an animal that we have available for adoption. This is Cora, and she's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. I know um, maybe people always don't think about purebred uh, dogs being in the shelter, but look at how gorgeous she is. Um, she's three years old. I think she has a lot of energy. I think that's why she's been with us a little while, but um, I will send you the link to this profile if you know anyone that um, likes Rhodesian Ridgebacks or likes dogs with a lot of energy. Um, she's really beautiful and she could use um, some help um, being promoted. Um, and then I'm going to switch. Can everybody see my events page now too? Yes, okay. Um, so uh, if you're ever interested in what's going on at San Diego Humane Society, a super easy way to do that is just to go to our website, sdhumane.org slash events. Um, and it shows you everything going on. Um, so I wanted to point out, uh, we have a really cool lecture coming up um, next, um, which will be on the 29th. And it's one of our pet talks that really um, involves the community and having um, community members really talk about issues that uh, affect pets. So sh this is going to be a lawyer talking about um, housing um, and laws that affect animals um, in regards to housing. So she's going to talk about being a land uh, landlord or being um, someone renting or owning um, all different types of issues. So you can um, always find out more um, by clicking here. And I will share uh, information about the next um, upcoming lectures as well so that everybody gets access to that. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and kick it off to Melissa who is going to tell you about Hearts and Hooves. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I am going to actually really quick introduce you to one of our animals that we use. Uh, he is a baby goat, he is five weeks old and he is ready to go back to his mama. So before he starts screaming again, um, I'm going to introduce you to him. Um, I turn my computer, my daughter has him. He's right here. So he is our newest um, member um, in therapy um, trainee. He had his first offsite visit today. Um, he did amazing. He had one accident, which is totally normal because he's still learning everything. But he's um, going to make an amazing therapy um, goat just like his mama. So this is oatmeal and my daughter, Kinley, that's helping. She's going to go ahead and put him back real quick so that way he can get back to his mama. <laughs> um, so 
with that, um, as you might think now, heart and hooves therapy um, has to do with farm animals is what we use. Um, so we use miniature horses. We have a miniature donkey. We have um, two goats. We have chickens, a miniature therapy pig, and we also have three full-size horses. So our um, program is basically animal assisted therapy and animal assisted activities, which we use our farm animals for. All of these animals that we use are my personal animals that I have hand selected either from a breeder or I've rescued them. So they're a combination of both. Um, and they, they're all really great animals. Um, but heart and hooves therapy was a vision of mine that I developed um, six years ago. I uh, myself was in foster care. I was put up for adoption and I wanted to find a way that I could give back um, at some point. And knowing horses helped me through my hard times, um, I was able to finally at a point in my life, I have three kids, so we were able to be able to um, start our own organization, my husband and I. Um, so Heart and Hooves came about. Um, my very first um, mini was Tori and Chips. Um, Tori's right here. We're going to introduce you to her real quick. So this is Tori. She is seven years old now, and I've had her since she was 14 months old. She goes all over. So pre-COVID, we went to Ronald McDonald House, Costa de Amparo, Rady's Children's Hospital. We went to Grossmont Hospital um, all over um, with her. She rides in elevators. She goes inside um, buildings. She does libraries. I, you name it, we've been there. We've done it, um, as well as most of our other crew members. Um, but um, a lot of what we do with our program is outdoors. It's our on-site program. And again, pre-COVID, we were seeing about 380 clients on-site. And we were working with children with autism, Down syndrome, ADHD, ODD, OCD, uh, rare genetic disorders. We work with the clinic at Radies Children's for um, alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. So we get a lot of referrals um, for that. And so what we do with, with the animals is essentially we are instructing and teaching the kids how to safely handle the animals, how to communicate with them correctly, um, how to take care of them. And so in turn, you're teaching responsibility, how to communicate. Um, so then it also breaks down to, we work with OTPT and speech therapists. We work with social workers for kids in foster care. Um, and then our other portion of our program is um, we travel, it's off site. So again, pre-COVID, we were doing about 80 visits a year um, to memory care, senior facilities, hospitals. Um, we work with a couple different veteran organizations um, to service um, them. And then um, we, we also, now that COVID has happened, we have had to kind of transfer over to do Zoom stuff. So we developed last year story time with the horses so our clients could still stay engaged. So I pick a story, I ask the um, family what animal the child wants uh, me to go sit with. I read the book that's age appropriate and then we kind of go over the animal and stuff. So that was really helpful to keep our clients engaged that way. Um, also some of our group homes, we were able to do farm tours. So similar, we'd have about 20 to 30 different um, consumers that would go around and we would do all the different farm things. Um, so they got to just participate and we'd ask questions and answer questions and things like that as well. Um, and um, kind of, going on to about our animals and how we select them and how we come about to get them. Um, like I had mentioned, Tori was one of my first. Um, I got her at seven months old and she came from a breeder. She was for sale for uh, a long time. Nobody really wanted her because she was very petite and it's with many horses, the petite and small tend to have um, health issues and stuff. Thankfully, by the 
the grace of God, we are, we're clear of all of that. Um, so I trained her myself. Um, I got her to load in the back of a horse trailer, no problem. I took her to my first senior home. And from there, it was a hit. Got another one that I rescued, Chips. And again, he was in a bad situation. He came from the San Diego Humane Society. He was a seizure, um, one of 27 other animals. So I got him and he was scared, beyond scared. Everybody in my family thought I was nuts for taking him on. And he has turned out to be one of the all-time best therapy horses I've ever had. Um, and, I, and I always tell Tori, earmuffs, earmuffs. <laughs> but um, he's fantastic. He's amazing. He's almost 20 years old now. I, got, I rescued him when he was 12. He goes everywhere, anywhere. We go to a lot of special needs schools. So there's a lot of equipment around him and stuff. And he'll stand for days. Um, he's, he's amazing. But... Um, a lot of when we are selecting animals, um, for me, it comes from my heart. Um, I, I look and I, I can see they have a kind eye, they have a good disposition, they're willing, they, they want to help and heal. Um, not all horses or animals are meant to be therapy animals. Um, it is kind of challenging you know, in the beginning because you don't know. You have to put them through a lot of training and a lot of steps to be able to identify if they are going to make a great animal or not um, in the therapy world. Um, I have a pretty good knack for it, not to toot my own horn, but um, I have um, 11 teams that are with us as well um, throughout San Diego. So we've all handpicked or rescued or, you know, gone through the process of acquiring their animals for them and training them, training their handlers and all of that. So we have a pretty, a pretty good um, crew and animals and we know what animals can do what so for example one of my rescues Remy she I rescued from slaughter um, at Bowie Texas she came to California with 30 other mini horses she was pregnant I fell in love with her instantly I knew she was pregnant even though she was only four and a half months old or four and a half months along I knew she was pregnant and I just knew she had a kind heart and I wanted her, I wanted to adopt her I adopted her, she had her baby, her baby AJ ha is one of our top therapy horses now too. And she is, she's amazing. She, she has told us though, that she prefers to stay on site. She doesn't like to travel. She will load and she'll go, but it's, it's very nerve wracking for her. So what we do for our program is we, we opted to keep her um, to just do on site work because that's where she's comfortable. So um, we, we don't give up on them. Um, we, we continually train. We always put them in situations to better them and to, to get them to be able to learn. Um, so that's one situation where she she's clearly has told us that it's, it's just too much trauma for her. And it, it goes back to the auction scenario. She gets around a lot of cars and noises. It's bringing her back to that and the PTSD sets in. And we want her to be comfortable. So she's um, one of our great on-site horses. Um, so uh, kind of introducing all of that kind of goes into our work and um, what exactly animal assisted therapy is and animal assisted activities. Um, when I started, I started with pet partners and pet partners, that's what they called it, animal assisted activities. They have since changed it to animal assisted interventions. I have chose to keep keep it because of the nonprofit paperwork and stuff. So it's the same thing, interactions and activities, it's, it's the same thing. Um, but I started with pet partners and I quickly learned that um, I love pet partners and I think it's a great starting point. However, it's not geared for many horses and the line of work that we do using farm animals and such. So I got registered with um, a couple other organizations that specialize and, and do special training, excuse me, and tests for miniature horses. And they also do our miniature donkey. Um, so our work includes a lot of different parts and pieces, kind of how I mentioned earlier. We work with a lot of social workers. We work with therapists. We work with um, speech, um, all kinds of different clinics. We get a lot of, um, a lot of calls for children with autism because what we're finding and, and other um, 
therapies are finding is getting outside of the office is a huge change and it's a huge deal. So um, we get to work with a lot of kiddos with autism and that's kind of been like for the last four years, that's been like one of our top um, notches that we've been um, able to do, which has been really nice. Um, and then the other kind of work that, that we do is going and traveling. You know, if, if you are in a hospital, if you have an illness, if you are just in a memory care and you've recently moved or something, you know, like it's scary, it's different. If you're an animal person and you don't get to see animals, going and seeing them is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, but having them come to you is like, you, it's, it, you just don't hear about it, especially when it's a mini horse coming out of an elevator and going into your room and you just get to see, or, you know, when we go and we bring our mini pig and you have a pig lover that you didn't even know was there and they just instantly melt and they, you know, they're interacting and engaging in a different way. Um, it's nice for the staff to be able to have interactions as well because they're constantly moving and shaking and, you know, they might get clients in there that are having a bad day or having a bad week or, you know, and, and they need that kind of, hold on, let me take a moment and let me have some me time, say hello to this cute little horse and just breathe. So um, that's kind of like the importance of our work, I feel like in our community is we get to give back in a very different way. We get to bring smiles and happiness and joy, but we also get to do something productive. Um, you know, we're working with a lot of different components, OTPT speech, we're working with fine motor skills, gross motor skills, hand-eye coordination, all kinds of stuff together. We're working on you know, the emotional side, the physical side, the spiritual side, all of it combined together. It's really, really nice. Um, and I, I really enjoy it. And I'm glad that I get to share it with so many different people. Um, today we were, today was one of our few visits that we've gotten to go on since last year. And just being in the group home setting again, we were outside, everybody was wearing masks, you know, and we did our protocol, but it was just so nice to be able to see everybody just smiling and happy and kissing and hugging the animals and just engaging. And, and one of the, the gentlemen, he doesn't engage for any other activity except for when we come. So it was nice to be able to see him even after four months, because we were able to go before things changed tears last year, but then when it changed again, we couldn't. So those are the, those are the moments that make me like, oh, all the training, the poop scooping, you know, all of the hard work is 110% worth it. Um, basically now, um, I think Amelia, if you want to share the screen, you can kind of show some of the pictures just so you guys can kind of get an idea more of what we do as well. And I'll just kind of share a little bit about each picture. Um, so this gentleman, he's 36 years old and he's with our group called um, St. Madeline Sophia Center. You might've heard of it. They're based in El Cajon and they provide day services for adults with disabilities. Um, and he is working with our one of our babies. Her name's Violet. She's one of my um, COVID buys. <laughs> I rescued her. Her mom was um, uh, rescued from an auction, pregnant, and then she was born. So her name's Violet. But he he's able to work on his mobility. So he's leading the horse, training the horse, focusing on that, not focusing on, oh, how far do I have to walk? How far do I have to walk? So he he has already, he's only come for four weeks now, and his parents have already seen a difference in his mobility, his endurance, and his happiness. So um, we love being able to share our program and, and uh, teach them job skills. That's one of the things that he gets to learn when he comes to because they come for three hours and we teach them all about our program, how we train the horses, everything. All right, you wanna go to the next one? This is Remy, who I was telling you about um, that I rescued her as well. And Caitlin, Caitlin, I met when she was 16 years old, very shy. She has Down syndrome, nonverbal, um, 
very sweet, loves animals. Now we fast forward, she's almost 19. She's graduated high school. Her and I can actually have a conversation and we understand each other. It's still very, you know, short sentences, but we can actually understand each other. And she's come um, a long way with her fears. She used to be very afraid of the animals. If they moved their head, she would back away. She would get scared. Now she puts the halter on by herself. She leads the horse by herself. She knows how to control the horse. So if the horse is walking too fast, she pulls back, says easy. Um, and all of these things that they're learning here, they can transfer over to home life. They can do school, all different stuff. All right, so we'll go do our next one. Awesome. So this is actually from today. And this is Piper, our miniature pig I was telling you guys about. She is um, a registered therapy pig. She passed her test with flying colors. Um, and what we do with her is we take her through. Everyone gets to pet and, and learn about her and stuff. And they get to ask questions. But then we also show them how to get her to do her tricks. So she can sit on command. She can go up on her hind legs and give you a kiss with her snout. She can spin to the left, spin to the right. She can sit and stay, and she can also come on command. And so what we do is we let each participant that we're visiting offsite or onsite um, be able to have the opportunity to do that because it teaches confidence, respect. It teaches you to slow down and, and focus on what you're doing, be present in the moment. And it's super fun because the animal is listening to you. And for children and adults with disabilities, that is something that is very challenging for them. It's very hard for them to be able to get out what they are wanting to be able to process and be able to, to, to answer back. So when you're giving them different commands and, and all of our commands are verbal and we use our hands. So even the nonverbal clients are able to participate. All right, so we'll go ahead and do our next one. So this little lady here is one of our very special clients. I have been working with her and um, Tori down there who you met earlier. Um, they both are the same age. They're both seven and they both met each other when they were three years old. I started working with uh, Victoria um, through Sunny Days, which is an early development um, organization here in San Diego. And we were working with her physical therapist and her occupational therapist. So I would go to her house, we would have sessions and we'd work on um, her grasping the brush, reaching and stretching on both sides. Um, she has a condition where um, it's basically muscular dystrophy, but for children. So she has no muscle at all. So she's on a ventilator 24 seven, but she's smart as a whip. So our sessions now have transitioned to her coming on site and we, she leads Tori. She tells her to walk. She tells her to hoe. She tells her to step. She tells her easy, whatever she needs to do to control her. And her and Tori have this special, unique relationship where whenever they see each other, they have to give love first before we can even start a session. And it's the cutest thing. Tori will go up to her cheek and Victoria will close her eyes. And, and that's her way of expressing her love. And um, it's just an amazing thing that we get to do. So we literally can serve any and all with our organization. There's no um, in between or there's no, uh, there's no really anybody that we can't help in some way. We're able to cater to any. Um, and so that's kind of like an overview of our different clientele. Um, and just kind of, um, yeah, like sharing what we do. It's, it's a lot to share in a short time and I hope I didn't go too fast. <laughs> I think that's, it's fascinating. Does anybody have any questions for Melissa? You can put them in the chat or you can um, unmute yourself. Um, I have a question I'll, I'll ask real quick. How um, hard or easy is it to get into the different places that you go? Like, do you, um, do they have a lot of requirements for you or are they the ones inviting you? How does that process work? Um, well, now that we are kind of like the talk of the town since we've been doing it for a while, 
it's pretty easy because we have a lot of referrals from other places. So like our memory cares, our hospitals, things like that, the admins all kind of chit chat around. Um, but whenever we get a call for like a hospice patient or something that's in a facility, we have to call, we have to talk to the admin we um, or the administrator there. And we have to basically explain what we do. And 90% of the time when I say I'd like to bring a mini horse in, they go, what a horse? They didn't even hear mini. So I literally have to walk through the steps. I have to send pictures. I have to send letters of recommendation. Um, and then our insurance. We have a very large insurance policy because of the line of work we do um, to ensure um, that nobody gets hurt. And if they were to get hurt, we're properly covered. So it is kind of challenging um, sometimes to be able to get people to understand exactly what we do. But once we lay it out there, it, it's pretty easy. And then, like I said, they kind of chit chat with each other. So we've picked up a lot of different places we visit because of that. Melissa, hi, this is Kim Lyon, and I'm just curious, um, did you have uh, any particular formal training or how did you uh, get so well qualified at working with animals and people together, kind of knowing a combination of um, how animals would be good as therapy, but also doing uh, basically, I guess, um, therapy work with people, uh, it almost sounded a little bit like maybe some occupational therapy or just, uh, it, it takes a big skill set, and I wondered how you acquired that. Yeah, um, so I was adopted. I was in foster care first. My mom was a foster parent for 35 years and she took in um, medically fragile kiddos. Basically, after she adopted me, she adopted five others. And I basically learned from her because she was taking all of these different kiddos to therapy and stuff and then she'd have to come home and do a home therapy plan she was teaching them how to do all of the things we were doing um, as typical children um, just a little bit altered so that was how I was raised I was raised just you know knowing how to do that and then horses I got into when I was about 13 and a half 14 to help me through my growing pains of just not understanding why I was put up for adoption why my parents didn't want me you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then um, I, I just wanted to be able to give back. And so did my husband and, um, you know, working with um, a bunch of animals and then bringing in people with them. It's just kind of a given. It, it was just kind of like, this is natural. Um, the OTPT speech, um, all of that kind of stuff um, was in the beginning. I just reached out. I reached out to different organizations and I just said, this is what we do. This is how we could help your organization or we could help your business. Would you like to partner up with us? And so that's kind of how we, we grew in that aspect. Um, so like working with the autism tree, working with um, therapeutic approach to growth, we team up with the ABA therapists, um, OTPT speech, we do psychologists, um, social workers, you name it. We just partner with them because the ultimate goal is to have the child or the adult succeed. So um, there's no competition. And um, so, yeah, I hope that kind of answered your question. <laughs> yes, thanks. That's great. Um, and then I, I'm not sure how to do the chat. Let me see. Because I saw there's a couple questions. If I can ask the questions for you. Oh, okay. One question is, um, how are you funded and are you able to take insurance? Thank you for sharing oh. about your amazing organization. Oh, awesome. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit and we do ask for a donation fee for those that can afford it. It's um, $25 and that is for a 45 minute to an hour session. And um, if you are not able to afford that or you know a family that's not able to afford that we can find a grant funding or something so we don't turn anyone away for the inability to pay um and then um I'm, what was the second part sorry oh, do you take insurance <laughs> oh yes um we don't take insurance at this time because we are considered an alternative therapy we are not um considered like a traditional therapy 
So um, currently we are doing a couple different studies with some, we have one study going on with a behavioral specialist. And then we have another study going on with an actual um, social worker and a doctor. So that way we can chart all of our progress and everything and then potentially, you know, get it written up and have it be 100% legit. And then we can present it to different companies and share like look you know if this is successful here's our evidence and and that's what a lot of um, insurance companies need they need the evidence-based model and um, so we're getting there and like I said you know we don't turn anyone away for the ability to pay so if you don't have insurance we can still service you okay and then there is another question um Hi, Melissa, I'm blown away by your super special organization. Do you have volunteers that help with your work? Yes, yeah, so um, we don't have a lot of volunteers just because um, I'm kind of different with my volunteers in the aspect of I don't let you pick and choose. It's either you volunteer with us in all aspects, in all forms of the work. So. It's from training, scooping poop to actually doing the work. Um, and it's also fun time too. Um, I've had in the past a lot of volunteers, unfortunately, that just wanna come and just wanna work with the animals. They don't want to help when we have clients or when we do small groups um, or you know, just come out and help me clean stalls and you know, bathe and trim all the animals and stuff. So we love volunteers as long as you're on board to, you know, participate on all levels of, of it. Um, and there's no, um, I mean, there's an age requirement uh, under 14, they have to have an adult here that stays with them 14 and up. You know, we're totally fine with them coming and staying for an hour or so and just helping us do stuff. Currently, we have, um, I have two volunteers that have been with me, one for five years and one for four years. They both started when they were 13. Um, one is now almost 20 <laughs> and the other is she's a little over 16 um, and then we have an intern that's with us right now but she'll be leaving soon she just was doing intern for um, child development at the University of Nazarene Naz Point Loma Nazarene University so she'll be leaving us soon and then I have one other kiddo who is um, with our adult transition program at the high school up here and so she comes to get work experience and stuff. So yeah, we love volunteers. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions for Melissa? All right, well, I think we will um, let Melissa get inside because it looks like it might be getting chilly. <laughs> And, and it is getting dark outside for here. Yeah. And we will um, have Shannon speak about Soul Paws and her experience. So thank you so much, Melissa. And of course, um, thank you. Yeah, so I will um, make sure I send the link to her organization in my follow-up email so everybody has that if, you're, if you want to refer um, to her website for any more details. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, Melissa. You're so amazing. Oh, thank you. Cool. Shannon, do you want me to share my screen or do you want to talk first? Sure. Yeah, if you could share the screen. Okay. Um, hi, hi, everybody. I'm Shannon Kopp. Um, a little warning, I have a nine month old and a toddler outside the door and <laughs> I'm not sure when they're gonna bust in, but I'm here with my emotional support animal, Bella, and I'm hoping um, it will be quiet for about 15 minutes so I can share with you my personal experience um, about how animals truly saved my life and rescued me from uh, an eating disorder, depression, and other mental health issues at the San Diego Humane Society, actually. Um, and then share with you about an organization um, called Soul Pods. So with that said, I just wanted to provide an introductory slide about eating disorders. Um, there's many misconceptions about them. Uh, they are among the deadliest mental illnesses, uh, second only to opioid overdose. There's one death every 52 minutes. They impact people of all ages, races, sizes, gender, sexual orientation, um, and background. 
And um, I personally developed bulimia nervosa as a teenager. I grew up in a traumatic environment in an alcoholic home and um, turned to eating disorders, uh, eating disordered behavior to cope. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I progressively um, got worse and worse, uh, meaning I, I began to seek counseling in college. Uh, I moved to California from the East Coast after college and was at the point where I was engaging in eating disorder behaviors up to 20 times a day. I literally could not function anymore. I was starting to um, have health consequences um, and couldn't work, couldn't, um, and it was, it was a really difficult time. I'm a pretty driven person. I was always someone who set her mind to something, whether it was very young, I've always been into animal rescue and did a lot of amazing things as a child to help animals and uh, whatever I set my mind to, I accomplished, but with the eating disorder, similar to my father's alcoholism, no matter what I did, what help I, I saw, and it was all human help at the time, I only seemed to get worse and worse. And I, I was hospitalized at the age of 22 at an eating disorder treatment center called Rosewood in Arizona. Uh, I, I, my insurance cut on day two there, which was horrifically sad and tragic and happens all the time with mental health issues and treatment. Uh, I got a couple more weeks of um, outpatient therapy there, thanks to my mother who funded it and experienced equine therapy there. And for me, it was this wake up call of, oh, before this eating disorder started, before my whole life became consumed by bulimia and depression, I was an animal person and I, I felt so safe among those horses. And when I came back from treatment back to San Diego, I started working with an incredible therapist who I'd actually worked with for 10 years, uh, who started utilizing different um, forms of therapy with me. One it was called acceptance um, and commitment therapy and really had me get in touch with my values and what made me feel like I wanted to still be alive and fight this illness and it was animals. Uh, and shortly after that, a job came up at the San Diego Humane Society. It was for a marketing coordinator position. Uh, and I was, it was my dream job. And I was absolutely positive that I wouldn't get it because I had such low self-esteem and yet um, I, I did. And it changed my entire life uh, to work in a place that was so in line with my values and the person I wanted to be. It gave me a reason to get out of bed and fight that eating disorder. Uh, and it motivated me. And I continued working with my therapist, with a dietitian, with a psychiatrist. And we agreed, I was probably the only person at the San Diego Humane Society that hadn't adopted an animal. Everybody, Amelia can speak to this, has animals at their cubicles. We have baby gates and people would have, you know, their dogs. There was an amazing three-legged pit bull named Finley that was just over. Um, rabbits, birds, everything. Sometimes there were cats and, and kittens in people's offices. And I was the only one because I made a pact with my therapist that in, in, when I went one year free of eating disorder behaviors, um, I was ready to adopt because obviously adopting an animal is a very big decision. It's bringing someone into your family. And um, I needed to learn, know that I could take care of myself, feed myself, nurture myself before I um, adopted an animal. So during that year, um, I started at the San Diego Humane Society on all of my breaks, basically at every opportunity, sitting with the animals there, spending as much time with them as I could and talking to them verbally about what I was feeling and experiencing, all the fear I had, all the anxiety I had. Sometimes I would binge on food and I would go into an animal habitat or into this you know, kennel with puppies and just let them crawl all over me and literally ground me, you know, eating disorders and like many mental health issues really center in the brain and in those thoughts um, that drive really unhealthy, harmful behaviors. And so when I would be among the animals like this, and these are puppies, I'm working at the Humane Society in this picture, 
they would they would pull me out of those destructive urges and those depressive thoughts and into this moment where these animals loved me and were thrilled about me. I was not thrilled about myself. I did not love myself. And yet it was a pretty powerful experience every day to come to work and you open the door and an animal is just thinks you are amazing. And it makes you think, well, maybe, maybe they're onto a little bit of something. Maybe I'm not all bad. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, I, um, I, that's Roxy. Uh, that was a deaf Dalmatian I remember working with. Part of my job was to take the animals onto TV segments and radio. And I remember how special it was to see her overcome some of her own trauma and fears and anxiety and open up. And I saw that every day in all the animals I got to work with at the Humane Society. If you go to the next slide, um, I adopted Bella. That is her as a puppy. She was here earlier. Now she wants her space. Um, but she, I adopted, I think like to the day of when I had went a year without eating, just engaging in eating disorder behaviors. And Bella came with me to therapy appointments, to doctor's appointments, to dietitian's appointments. She helped me though. She tried to eat the meals as well. <laughs> you get through meals. And really, I, I don't believe I'd be alive if not for my emotional support animal, Bella. And slowly over time, I fully recovered from the eating disorder. It's been over 10 years now that I've gotten to live free and happy and healthy in my body. I've gotten a second chance at life. And um, I really believe that the turning point for me is when I started working at the San Diego Humane Society and with a therapist who understood the value of the human animal connection. And um, similar uh, to our first speaker, I felt um, that the most important thing I could do with my life is, is give back, um, give back and especially share the experience I had with animals with others. Um, a lot of people in eating disorder treatment are without their animals and miss them terribly and are facing, you know, the greatest battle of their life. Uh, I wanted to find a way to bring the healing power of animals to them. I wanted to find a way to bring it to community members. And I wanted to create a unique forum for people to experience the, the power that is um, being with an animal one-on-one -on -one in the quiet and looking into their eyes or holding them or stroking their backs and experiencing all the benefits um, that come with just the mere presence of an animal. So um, Soul Paws was born after that about, oh, goodness, five years ago, we became a 501c3 organization Four and a half years ago, I think. And I have a, a little video that will do a much better job sharing about soul pause <laughs> than I can. <laughs> so if we could play that. I think it's the link, yeah, right, right above the picture. I hope it works. Oh, good. <laughs> I came to the first soul pause meeting about a year ago and just got to spend an hour with these amazing dogs. They're so calm, they're so in the moment. And the more I spent time with them, the more I realized just how uh, important this is for me and how much I learned from them. I started Soul Pause because I honestly don't believe I'd be alive if not for the love of animals. When I was around animals, that feeling of shame kind of dissipated. And I found that I could just cry or talk to them in a way that was more real than around people. They are the sort of antidote in a way to eating disorders. They are so present and so mindful and so non-judgmental that I can't help but be a little kinder to myself. really what has helped to keep me sober. 
what I truly love and value about Soul Paws is the relationship between eating disorders and recovery and animals and, and that partnership that just seems almost magical. It's just a very relaxing experience. It's, it's so important. And I think that having animals around, regardless of the animal, helps to make us feel safe. And I think that, that coupling that safety along with staying mindful and grounded is something that really helps with, with any kind of, of struggle. Thanks, Amelia. <laughs> so Soul Pause really would not be possible if not for the San Diego Humane Society, Dr. Annie Peterson, who you saw um, there, Patricia, who you'll hear from soon. Um, I have, I can just briefly go into how a Soul Pause workshop um, works. And just to be clear, we do not have our own therapy animals. We partner with um, therapy. Um, animal therapy organizations, um, some in Orange County, You'll, the ones in that picture from an organization that I cannot remember the name of right now, I apologize, in Orange County um, during that workshop, um, or San Diego Humane Society, their pet assisted therapy team, or canine ambassadors. Uh, and in the first years, we were holding um, almost monthly workshops, and then we moved to quarterly workshops um, that take place now at the San Diego Humane Society. Um, we're really hopeful and excited to expand workshops in the future. Patricia in Philadelphia had just started one right before the pandemic hit. And if you go to the next slide, um, how a Soul Pause <laughs> workshop happens is it's a clinician led workshop. So in San Diego, Emily Con Conlin, <laughs> Bella leads the workshops. Um, they're always free and open to anybody who struggles with food and body issues. We often, Bella, sorry. <laughs> we often have um, treatment centers bring their clients to the workshops. So they will be patients that are currently um, being treated at a hospital or residential center, sometimes a partial hospitalization center, they will bus the patients in to the Humane Society so they can participate in this workshop. Um, and the workshop can incorporate, we usually either do just dogs or we'll have a small animals workshop, which will include guinea pigs, um, rabbits, and rats. Occasionally we are able to combine dogs with miniature horses, which is always our most popular workshop. Um, and the curriculum has been uh, designed by one of uh, Emily Conlin, a clinician, um, and it's inspired by the evidence-based model of dialectical behavioral therapy, though we're looking to expand and maybe have a blended curriculum that brings in other um, uh, forms of therapy. And if you go to the next slide, how it works is the, uh, when participants come, there's an opening introduction, everybody shares their name and something they love about an animal, which is just a nice light way to, for everybody to uh, get to know themselves. And often they're um, not everyone is in a pretty tough time in their lives. So you can see just the smiles and people light up at the mere mention of an animal that they've loved or, um, or uh, had in the past. And then we introduce the therapy animals. Then we have some sort of activity. So sometimes it's a mindfulness um, meditation. Sometimes it's uh, we actually walk through the San Diego Humane Society and observe the animals and do a grounding meditation. There's some form of activity. 
Then we have what we call a soul pause where everybody spreads throughout the room for 20 minutes. It's in complete silence and we have the animals one by one visit the participants and interact with them. And that's really um, my favorite part of the workshop. Um, sometimes we'll have about 20 participants and about four or five animals. So while people are waiting for an animal to come to them, they're journaling. Um, and the goal is for everyone to have quiet time with each animal. And then um, we come together at the end and the clinician leads a discussion as the animals continue visiting with our um, participants. And um, you know, the feedback that we've gotten has, has been really inspiring. It makes me very emotional, but for example, um, one, one participant said at our last workshop before COVID, stopped our in-person workshops um, that it, she was afraid, uh, it was a small animal workshop to hold the guinea pig. She was afraid the guinea pig wouldn't wanna be held by someone like her because she saw herself as a monster. She had let her eating disorder um, let is not the right word, but she felt in her mind that she had let it get so out of control. Eating disorders are never a choice. They're um, involved genetics and um, life circumstances and many complicated factors, but she blamed herself for it. And she felt ashamed that it had gotten so severe and impacted her family life. And she she was afraid that, you know, the guinea pig would sense that energy, this energy that she felt, I'm a bad person, I'm a bad mother and, and wouldn't want to be held. And in fact, that guinea pig stayed with her for the entire 20 minutes of the workshop, right pressed to her heart. Um, and as she, as she cried and in the group sharing after she shared, you know, for the first time in, as long as I can remember, I, I don't, feel like I'm a monster. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm a bad person. And um, that guinea pig reminded her of that. So um, that in a nutshell is how our Soul Pause workshops uh, have worked over the past few years. We're hoping now that um, I've had two babies. And so I'm really looking forward to working with Patricia and some of our board members to take Soul Pause to the next level um, and develop um, a way for clinicians first starting in California to offer soul pause workshops to their clients with eating disorders in, in Pennsylvania where Patricia is and to expand um, soul pause uh, further. So that is everything I had wanted to share. I definitely want to make sure Patricia has time to share some of her amazing research. All right, are there any um, questions specific to Shannon before we move on to Patricia and the research? Hi, Shannon, um, it's Rachel. I actually met you about six years ago. You probably don't remember, but um, yeah. this was at the Pities in the Park event, the first year they had it. And you were there um, with your book and I got your book and I just remembered meeting you. It just had a huge impact on me. Um, but also just wanted to share cause I'm, um, I'm an occupational therapist now. So I was really intrigued by what you and Melissa and everybody are doing. Um, cause I'm actually working on my doctorate right now in OT, um, studying animal assisted therapy. So I just, I'm feeling emotional <laughs> just hearing about what you're doing because I think it's so fantastic. And I would just love to stay in touch with you and just um, learn more and, you know, see how we could connect through all this. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. <laughs> oh, definitely. So thank I'm you. Sure. Yeah, Amelia can, I'm sure, share my email when we send out the resources and I'd love to connect with you. Um, Great. Definitely, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Shannon, we have a question in the chat too. Um, thank you so much for sharing about your amazing organization. You're such an inspiration. Um, I have to agree, I was also crying uh, during that. Um, do you see Soul Pause expanding to work with individuals with other mental health disorders? I, someday I do. I really want to um, focus right now on, on eating disorders to make sure that we um, 
are doing the best job possible at creating um, workshops that, and I'm working right now with a wonderful mentor from another nonprofit organization to really further define the mission of Soul Pause and the challenges in um, eating disorders that we're hoping Soul Pause can help um, because uh, it's not meant to be a form of uh, clinical treatment as I really, you know, eating disorders are very complex issues that require usually a, a treatment team. I could go on and on about all the challenges that people face to, uh, and reasons why people don't seek treatment. So we're hoping that in offering free workshops and offering access to a clinician and in offering access to animal assisted activities, um, we can help people that are either struggling to, um, find treatment, um, have the courage to seek treatment, who can't afford treatment, um, who are struggling with motivation to help motivate them in their journey in the same way that animals motivated me when I was at the Humane Society. And I think once we get more clear on our mission and more clear on our process and expanding our workshops, then we'll look at other mental health issues because we know that animals can be helpful for in, in so many ways for so many things that people go through. Any other questions for Shannon? We're still going to be talking soul pause too with Patricia. So um, if you have questions, maybe that both of them may need to help answer feel free to do that after. Um, okay, so Patricia, would you like to share your research? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and Shannon, um, so wonderful to uh, hear from you. And um, I really just wanted to share a little bit about kind of the research side and how I kind of got interested in looking at kind of animal assisted interventions for eating disorders. I am a clinician and have my doctorate in social work and I was working pretty extensively in a clinical fashion and I kept on kind of getting all the clients who no one else wanted and they all seemed to have some sort of eating disorder or symptomatology, right? And like, oh, okay, it's interesting. Like, what's this about? And um, so it can be kind of um, known within the clinical world that like working, you know, intensively with an eating disorder patient can be difficult, can bring up a lot of reactions for the clinician because there may be defensiveness of letting go of the eating disorder where the clinician is like, you're killing yourself. Why would, why don't you just stop with the eating disorder behavior? But again, like if we just lead with that, we're gonna of course trigger a lot of defenses. So I guess I was offering a little bit more of a curious kind of perspective. Like what is the eating disorder giving to you? Like how is the eating disorder like adaptive? And in what, what I was kind of leading in and kind of joining with rather than necessarily vilifying the eating disorder, I was able to learn a little bit about some of the kind of protective functions of the eating disorder. It seemed like for a lot of these individuals, they said the eating disorder was providing like a relationship for them, a way in which they could kind of avoid things that were previously really kind of um, triggering for them, whether it be affective stimulation, like really intense emotions, I'm not dealing with that. So I can focus everything on the eating disorder and it protects me from everything else. So it was interesting to me. And then one client had said to me, like the only thing that like, I think about other than my eating disorder is my dog. And I was like, huh, I'm just kind of curious about kind of this coming up back to the relational kind of, um, insecurity or kind of like the relational vulnerability that was popping up um, with this kind of uh, population. So I started kind of my inquiry about eating disorders and animal assisted interventions. So I'll kind of start here. And a lot of my research is kind of framed by these theories of kind of eating disorders as one example of vulnerabilities in attachments. And I mean that in like how we attach to other people and have relationships and also in affect regulation, which is kind of the psychological way of saying how we deal with our feelings or maybe not deal with them. Rather. Let me just put this in slideshow. Um, all right. 
So I'll just give you a, a, a quick snapshot of my study. So here is just kind of a, the, the framework for my research was really that eating disorders are kind of an example of um, difficulties in affect regulation and attachment. And that the research on animal assisted therapies is that this is a therapeutic modality that can activate and support people, um, individuals with regulating affect and also repairing attachment. So I was like, huh, maybe we can explore how they kind of connect together, maybe. Um, so that kind of started the process. And Shannon did you know, a great job laying out why eating disorders you know, has the highest mortality rates um, and also kind of the treatment uh, statistics are pretty harrowing too, that only one in 10 individuals with eating disorders receive treatment. And of those people, only 35% receive treatment at an eating disorder specialized facility. Um, the financial burden, kind of insurance conceptualizing like that you're cured from an eating disorder when you're weight restored, which people know that it's often the very, like the, that's not recovery, right? That's like one measure in a whole complicated factors. So there's a lot of things that makes eating disorder treatment um, complicated. So this was just kind of a snapshot of some of my research methods. So I'm a qualitative research. Um, and as part of my research, I kind of interviewed, I conducted 40 interviews with women who had used an animal assisted therapy in their eating disorder treatment and um, transcribed all the interviews and then kind of looked for themes from the data uh, that were kind of um, snippets of, what was spoken to me in these conversations. And um, so what I kind of came to see kind of from like the analytical lens was that there are a few kind of emerging themes in the data that came up about how women used animal assisted interventions in their eating disorder treatment. And these are kind of like some of my scary uh, charts, but just bear with me because I feel like they kind of just try to highlight the process. And what you'll see here is that like it kind of what happened from the data was that these categories emerged about the way in which the animals seem to impact the women in their treatment. So um, this was kind of one kind of the starting of kind of grouping categories together. And there are kind of some more categories that seem to emerge from the data. And here is like my real um, scary concept map, but I think that it outlines some of the key themes that seem to emerge about how the animal was experienced, kind of animal as something. So it kind of seemed to be, these are the main categories. So an animal as something outside of their eating disorder, the kind of impact on their relationships in lots of different ways, being a companion, offering consistency, non-judgment, trust, protection. There is kind of this emotional piece um, the teaching and learning insights, the impact on their thoughts, how they thought about themselves, about their kind of their negative thoughts, and then some of the negative things that they found with kind of animal assisted therapy. So some of the, the quotes, I mean, I have so many, to, like every single quote was wonderful, but there were some, some really kind of ones that still make me tear up. But this one was really interesting too, because it kind of shows like that, the um, interaction with the animal was kind of like they were thinking of it as practice for what they would hope to have achieve with a human relationship. Um, so it was kind of a safe way to practice that type of relational exchange um, with the hope of kind of like transferring those skill set to human interaction. And um, and then what kind of really was a primary theme that came out of it was that the animal kind of acted as some sort of shield or protection or relational buffer. Buffer was a, a word that was used a lot. And so women, um, one woman, all the names have been changed. The dog was almost a shield, even though, I mean, technically it's like this little puppy, but like, just felt like, you know, it was a barrier between me and bad things. Um, so there is, there is what was coming out in the data from the interviews was that there's a way in which the animal provided in, in very different ways, but kind of similar ways too, the function of the eating disorder that previously provided that kind of protection for individuals. So it's swapping out the protective functions the eating disorder provide and then kind of 
moving in, the animal is kind of protecting you, but not in a way that like has the harmful impact of the eating disorder. Um, so it was providing that type of barrier. Um, so what does that mean for kind of our results and findings? It was kind of like a way in which to think about the role of the animal as kind of um, a way in which uh, they kind of felt like the, the animals were able to recognize the participants' needs, provide unconditional and non-judgmental support and offer of protection. And that, so they're kind of like in this way, individuals both kind of offered that the eating disorder had a relational function for me. It was kind of like a relationship I was in that protected me from bad things. And, um, but then they also offered that the animal was a relationship that I felt I was a part of too. And it also protected me from bad things. And that might be something I'd be willing to kind of explore further than talking to a therapist because I already don't trust human relationships. So it was interesting here that we kind of are learning about a relational experience that seems more, um, that they're more amenable to, and that may actually help individuals start to engage more in treatment. But again, this was kind of a very much exploratory study, but it's interesting in some of the kind of data that came out of it. Um, and I'm gonna just move here because I think that what I wanted to just end with was if like, what kind of comes out of this for us thinking about practice and research and future studies. It's just that you know, kind of the notion that underpins any type of therapeutic exchange uh, with humans is that like, oh, well, you know, we're gonna offer a trusting relationship through our unconditional positive regard, through our kind of non-judgmental stance. But what happens if people are just kind of triggered by the fact that you're another human based on their previously experiences with humans that haven't been positive based on how the eating disorder may usurp, you know, one's kind of feelings of safety in a human to human interaction. So we're just kind of like, again, challenging the idea that like any human to human exchange would be safe. Like, so maybe there needs to be a step before that human experience. Um, and and then just like inviting maybe some sort of evaluation or assessment of um, attachments and relationships. So one of the themes that also came out was that um, women found that their therapists, like when they were doing therapy, they, they weren't really ever asking about animals or even their experiences with animal therapy when they were in treatment. They kind of had this idea of like, well, that's like recreational. This is like treatment, treatment work. We're in therapy now. And that kind of disconnect was very off-putting to them because they people found in the study that like they felt like the most therapy they were doing was when they were with the animals. And so to kind of be more curious about one's experience with animals, maybe to to ask about a patient's experience with animals at home that can kind of give us lots of insights about how like what's important to someone one woman had shared with me like Shannon so kind of um you know eloquently shared too that she said that once I started working with an animal in animal therapy it was like the first thought like oh yeah like I know something else about myself other than that I have an eating disorder. Right? Like, I love animals, right? Because the eating disorder can really kind of become all encompassing. And so that was really profound. Um, and then again, just kind of like the idea about kind of ex exploration of the eating disorder, that was something that um, came out as well that there was a way in which um, women indicated that they felt kind of judged or kind of vilified for some resistance in giving up the eating disorder. So they found like, you know, one woman shared, you know, the dog didn't judge me if like I purged that night or I did that, right? There wasn't kind of anyone. So um, maybe there's room for our kind of practice applications coming out of the research to kind of offer a little bit more curiosity and less judgment about the role of one's eating disorder in their life, given that what we know about, it may take on a relational function. It may have been adaptive for someone to be able to survive really traumatic circumstances. So again, kind of like starting there rather than kind of being kind of setting it up that like you need to give this up because you're killing yourself because they probably know that <laughs> and um, you're gonna be met with more resistance.
And then just ending here, just kind of acknowledging the differences in human and animal relationships. Um, and to even just like inquire, like in my clinical work, like just being curious about how someone feels connected to people as opposed to how they connect with animals. That says a lot about someone. And, and I think that specifically with eating disorders that can also say a lot too, right? Like they may say, no one knows me like my dog knows me, right? Like, oh, okay, can you tell me more about that? Like, what's up with that? And so it may be a way to um, new opportunities for collaborating, for kind of joining with the client if we also acknowledge the differences in these type of relationships and to not only assume well, like, you know, we're in this helping relationship so I can help you. Maybe by virtue that I am a human and your negative experience with human, I'm not gonna be able to help you yet. So we have to kind of maybe start with an animal relationship first. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I really hope that um, to kind of do more research with, you know, animal assisted interventions and eating disorders. I think that there's a lot more to explore here. I think that um, Shannon's work with Soul Pause, which I'm so kind of um, grateful to be a part of, is really um, so innovative and much and very much needed. Um, and I think that also it makes sense with kind of this movement for kind of tr more trauma informed care and how to kind of continue that that idea forward and. Um, I think that the connection between attachment and eating disorders and animal therapy, it kind of just, is, in my conceptualization, kind of connects together. So it's worth further exploration. And, um, but thank you for, for listening to my research and happy to kind of share anything else with all of you. Are there any questions for Patricia about her research or involvement with Soul Pause? I have a question. Yes. Hi, Patricia. Um, Hi. Again, I just enjoy hearing all three of you. It's so interesting. Um, I think as an OT coming to it from a different perspective, it's also really interesting to me because, um, well, I really like what you said about curiosity. Um, I think that's so important to, to keep in mind as clinicians, right? Because um, I personally don't have experience working with people with eating disorders, but working with folks with PTSD and autism and so many other things, there are a lot of parallels, you know, mm -hmm. particularly in the mental health world. Um, and I think it's just, it's so valuable just to hear what you have to say and just what you've seen and experienced as I know also just how I've experienced working with animals and, and why I think this work is just so valuable and just so important. I think I'm curious. Um, I know you've done a lot of research and then you are continuing to do so. I think um, one of the things that's been challenging for me as a student is just finding a lot of research. Um, it, there's not a lot of research out there. And I know I also heard Melissa say earlier that, um, you know, having that evidence-based research is going to help her move her practice forward. And I know that's an issue kind of for everybody in all these realms. Um, so I'm just curious kind of how that process was for you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm like rolling my eyes and nodding because I'm just <laughs> like, yes, yes. And, right. Um, it's, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that animal assisted interventions is like so struggling with finding its footing and kind of being seen as like legit and having validity. So, um, you know, I think that there's, there's been some movement. Like, I think that there's been like maybe some like three or four kind of bigger meta-analyses done and a recent meta-analyses on um, like trauma-informed like animal-assisted interventions, but from kind of an eating disorder standpoint, like my research was like the first one. <laughs> so a very yeah. small sample, qualitative, right? So it's a, a very kind of very much like not generalizable, you know, obviously mm -hmm. lots of variables in place. So definitely not evidence-based pr practice like par yet. I think that, um, but the, you know, I think that you're right on the money there. <laughs> 
thank you, Talia. That's so kind of you. And, um, but you're right. It's, um, to, to kind of, it's, it's hard because like to get the funding, to get the grants, they want to see that, like, it's legit, but you're like, I need the funding to prove that it's legit. And you're like, so where am I going to go here? And, um, yeah. so it's, it's definitely something, you know, I had apply, applied for, you know, Anita grant, but they were saying, you know, you're kind of too small. Can you get some more backers and totally get it. And like, and, yeah. but I'm like, but, um, but you know what? Um, I'll persevere. Cause like, you know, I think that committed to, um, kind of just further exploration of this, uh, therapeutic modality for this population. And, yeah. um, so, uh, I'll just keep knocking on the doors, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Same. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you are too. And thank you so much for what you said. And, um, I really appreciate that. I think we need, uh, more kind of open-minded and curious, uh, helping professionals like yourself in the field. So that's awesome. Um, Thanks. No, it was a good reminder. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Talia. Oh, thank you so much for, um, oh, I know. I see your question. You know, I actually did offer one of my kind of students, Freya here is, is one of my students in my uh, graduate student, uh, graduate social work class. And you know the the place where I teach, they did let me teach take like, teach one class on animal assisted interventions and trauma, but it was uh, the first time that they'd done so. I think there's only one other place that does it, University of Denver, in their social work world that have kind of a. So it's a slow process, and <laughs> I think that I'd love for it to kind of get more. Um, will you be teaching at a BMC this upcoming year? Um, <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, I'll keep you posted, you know, and I think that it goes back to a little bit of some skepticism about, you know, the legitimacy of this. I mean, how can, you know, I mean, I think that it's hard, you know, to, but I think the legitimacy from kind of the hard sciences about, like, I recently submitted something to kind of like a really, like, I don't know, like, uh, maybe hard science -y journal that like in anthrozoology and they're like you know not really buying into it just yet but you know we'll have to kind of keep on you know that's why it's important to do more research and to kind of like refine our research instrument and I will kind of own you know because people the the facilities that I like looked at um I wasn't really looking at how the interventions were applied it was just kind of like whoever responded to my study and who kind of self-reported that they used animal assisted therapy in their eating disorder treatment so there was considerable variability because they were from different treatment sites you know some most some use different animals it was differently applied so I totally get it in terms of like that you, we need to get some more um kind of like at least consistency when we're kind of evaluating an intervention. And, um, but uh, let's see. So I don't know yet, Amanda, but thank you for asking that. And <laughs> uh, I would love to, and <laughs> um, yeah. Can I just add to that? I don't want to interrupt you, but- um, Of course, yeah. Because I saw yeah. there's a lot of interest in um, studying this and, um, Again, I'm coming from an OT perspective, so it's a little bit different, but um, I'm at USC. And so I know we've been trying to integrate some of that into the curriculum. And there's um, actually an undergrad class that I was helping out in last summer that's on the human animal bond. And so they talked to some of that. And then also right now um, I'm doing a residency with, um, it's called Bergen University of Canine Studies. Hmm. Um, and they're up in Sonoma. They, um, the woman who started it was actually the founder of Canine Companions of Independence. Um, so they started doing um, like training service dogs back in the 70s. And so um, the OT that I'm doing my residency with is actually um, trying to create more continuing education curricula for folks like us who are, you know, mental health professionals and occupational therapists and physical therapists and people that want to learn more about animal assisted interventions within the context of these professions. 
So That's just awesome. kind of throwing that out there. If yeah. anybody's it's so great that there's collaborating. No, that's wonderful. Yeah. And I think that, you know, pet partners um, came up earlier from Melissa's conversation. Right. I just um, had a call with them uh, just like, again, knocking on doors for grants and people, whatever, but they're creating kind of a professional organization for animal assisted intervention professionals in kind of cross disciplines. So people who are interested. So I think they're going to start to search for that, like on Facebook, because they're kind of starting to roll out a professional org, which they're hoping to kind of be a centralized hub for people who are interested in this offering kind of like continuing ed and also like to start gearing up for more standardization in the field, which I think is great. Um, awesome. And that's great. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, All right, are there any more questions? We have just a couple minutes left. And if anyone thinks of follow-up questions, you can always email them to me and I can pass them on to the speakers as well. All right, well, thank you so much to our speakers, Patricia, Shannon, and Melissa. Um, this was such a unique um, blend of experiences and practices and research, and I think everybody enjoyed it. So um, I will um, send our follow-up survey with the PowerPoints um, to anyone who wants to review those, and I will also send a link to the recording um, so that you can review anything you missed or, or re-listen to it. Um, thank you everybody for attending today, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.